Hi everyone, my name is Brittany and I'm so pleased to welcome you to this conversation with the filmmakers from Schwartz Program One. I'd like to thank the supporters of MoMA and Film at Lincoln Center for tuning in and thank you most of all to the filmmakers for joining us here. Um, it's so nice to finally be with all of you in some kind of setting. Well, I was just asking all of the filmmakers, we haven't really gotten started yet, maybe you could all just introduce yourselves, say where you are in yes. the world and your film and just how your artistic practice or artistic life has been during quarantine or isolation. Sure. Uh, this is Sonia K. Haddad. Uh, I'm an Iranian filmmaker. Um, I'm from Tehran. Uh, but now I'm talking with you uh, from a small city north of Iran, uh, which uh, I'm shooting my uh, new film uh, here. Uh, I'm the writer and director of the short film Exam. And i um, happy uh, hearing your voices and seeing your faces. <laughs> uh through this uh crazy weird uh quarantine time actually uh just today we started uh, a new lockdown unfortunately uh because um all the cities in iran are uh in a very bad situation i mean in terms of uh corona and uh so uh again we started another lockdown and um during the past eight, nine months, uh, we were in this trouble. So we were just staying at home and uh, just reading books, watching movies and working on our future scripts. So um, just two days ago, uh, I started my pre-production, but uh, I think I have to pause it because of the lockdown. So yeah, this is my situation now. <laughs> Thanks, Sonia. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Dorian, you yeah. want to introduce yourself? Um, yes. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Dorian Jespers. I'm the director of um, Sundog. Um, and I am now talking to you from a very small place in north of France, um, in uh, Tourcoing, where I started a new school, actually. And I am now spending half of my days on Zoom preparing the, the, this, this new project. Wong, please. Oh, hi. Uh, hi, this is Wong Ping. Um, now I'm, in, I'm staying in Hong Kong. Um, I'm the director of Wong Ping's Fables 2. Um, so I do animations and installations, exhibitions, um, but like everything is postponed to next year. So this year so far, I've been like cancel myself. So I, I, I didn't do anything. I haven't done anything at all. So um, yeah, looking forward to, you know, 2021, <laughs> yeah. I am Agustina. I am from Argentina, but right now I'm in New York for a, for a work. Um, I am the director of Monster God. And this year, I don't really know what happened, but I know that I, know that I wrote a lot, I read a lot. Um, I started working on, on a lot of future projects, but also I want to, I just finished also my, my first film. We are now like, we just finished it. And so I also am very interested in knowing what's going to happen with that to like be able to imagine a future for other possible films I'm going to direct. So right now, after all this work, it's just sitting and I'm doing other things and see what, how the world evolves. I guess I'll go. Hi, I'm uh, Raji Summer Singha. Um, I'm the director of The Eyes of Summer. I'm currently in Los Angeles um, in lockdown. Um, how have I been spending the time? Um, I've actually been really, really productive. Um, uh, I've I tend to keep an archive of footage. So I've just been editing a lot. I made 
four films uh, since lockdown. Um, I mean, I don't know if they're good, but I made four films. Um, and uh, my, I, I was working on a feature. I was going to shoot my first feature this summer in Sri Lanka, but that is on hiatus, so it's pushed to next year. So I've just been writing and doing boring fundraising stuff and making some shorts. So um, being relatively productive, I suppose. Thanks, guys. I guess during this period, I've been thinking so much about collaboration. And I think in some ways, there's sort of more collaboration than ever through these like digital spaces, but also those relationships and exchanges have changed a lot. So I'm wondering if you guys could tell us a little bit about the collaborations that maybe kind of kickstarted or were really crucial to the films um, in the program today. I can, I can answer that. Um, well, my whole, my, the film wouldn't exist without uh, like a true collaboration. Um, I, well, I went to my mother's village and I was really creating a space for improvisation. So I was really leaning on my family there. And uh, I mean, it was a true collaboration in that sense. I, I was creating um, scenarios, fic fictional scenarios, and um, uh, they would help me uh, bring them to fruition. And um, yeah, I was le really learning about everything in that space because uh, it wasn't a uh, it wasn't a space I was too familiar with. My mom doesn't go back to her village all that often, so. Um, and I hadn't been there for, for quite some time, but um, yeah, it was, uh, I mean, the film is, um, was realized very improvisationally and uh, yeah, I guess it was, uh, um, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot had to do with the uh, collaboration. Is that your family that appears in the film, the actors? Yeah, family and friends. Yeah, there were no, uh, it's a lot of non-actors, non-acting. And had your mom sort of, I guess, always been, I guess, open with you about this sort of like spirit relationship? She Yeah. It's always something. Yeah, yeah. She, uh, yeah, every time I call her, uh, no, no, not every time, but she, she's, uh, throughout my life, um, uh, she would talk about the the spirits around her and in her life throughout her life and it was very but I mean in uh, in Sri Lanka there's a very casual relationship with the spiritual world so it's not uncommon um that's I guess that's an aspect of the film uh in in trying to talk about the post-civil war era um so that was useful in that sense, yeah. And Sonia, I know that you co-wrote your film with Farnoosh, right? Who was actually at New Directors here a few years ago. Can you talk about that relationship? Yes, yes sure. Uh, so um, I think it was uh, about three years ago, uh, which I went to a minimal and film festival in Norway uh, to screen my previous film. And uh, we got to know each other in uh, that festival, me and Farnoosh. And it was a really good start uh, for both of us because uh, we, uh, I talked about uh, the idea I had and she was uh, so interested. And we started uh, to write um, that, uh, the script of the exam together. Uh, we were for a um, couple of months and um, it turned out a great script, which I worked on it. And uh, we are still um, working together sometimes um, and we are working in, in, uh, on an idea, uh, which is uh, a feature movie, but we are planning to shoot it for the next year. 
uh, but it was a great experience and collaboration. <laughs> And her last film, Gaze, which was um, here at New Directors a few years ago, is also kind of dealing with so much anxiety and I guess like the yes. intersection of that with gender and womanhood. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, th that was the reason uh, I wanted to work with her because uh, I felt that uh, specifically for this project, for exam, uh, she could understand um, the point of my movie and the story uh, that what I'm going to talk about, what I'm going to show and, uh, show and illustrate. And um, that's why uh, I chose Fanoush to, um, like, to be the co-writer uh, for my script. Um, yes, uh, you're right. The, I, I don't want to say the theme, but the, um, the atmosphere of both movies, gaze and uh, exam, are close. Yes. Wong, can you talk to us a little about you? You're sort of like a, a one-man band, right? <laughs> yes, so um, this question is not really like happens <laughs> to me. Well, you can talk about the flip side of it. Um, I guess, I don't know, I just, you know, since I started to make animation, I've always been like, working alone um, especially i think the medium as animation in hong kong i think is a bit like convenience for me because you know hong kong is too like very crowded everywhere so filmmaking and you know uh, taking like live action film is you need a team in a crowded city i think is I'm just being lazy or I think, you know, it's kind of like hard for me to get started. It feels more just... direct, right? To be able to just make something. Yes, you know, the, we can, I can just make it, you know, in my bedroom. That's how I started. So, um, yeah. So uh, since then I've been like enjoying you know, using this medium and, um, and the flexibility, like I, you know, doing everything by myself, even, you know, voice over, you know, um, one time I tried to find, you know, professional voiceover, you know, like, you know, person to do it for me, but turn out, I think he's too good, um, um, too much acting and uh, he's too, just too good. I think, you know, I, I just, you know, at the end, I, I did it by myself, like, um, you know, under the, you know, in a closet, you know, using my mobile phone and just record it. Um, so that's always been my practice. Um, yeah. Dorian or Augustina? I I really like to work with um with people. I I um I, I even need it. Like I cannot go forward if I'm if I'm just alone. Uh, which made this project um a bit difficult because it was my first film. I had no production, no money. But um, by convincing and talking and trying. We managed to gather like almost 200 people, I think, at the end on the project. So that was really, uh, um, that was really the atmosphere I like to I like to do with with, with many and uh, even funny collaboration in it. Like, I, for example, the guy who makes the special effect at the end of the film, like the sun uh, and the fake snow and everything. And I, I've never met him. Like, we just talk on WhatsApp. He's based in fake Tijuana. No. Fake snow, yeah, it's fake snow sometimes. Oh, like falling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. <laughs> it's everywhere. Uh, it's um, everywhere. Yeah. Uh, he made it. He, he'd never seen snow in his life, and I never seen him <laughs> yet. He it's made very the snow. <laughs> the snow in the project. Um, um, can you tell us about like that. Oh, sorry. Maybe who, because you're not from Russia, can you tell us maybe who led you to Russia or how that sort of unfolded? Mm. Is there anyone there? Yeah, I've I've worked uh, a lot with uh, a Chechen director, Denis Pitsaev, as a cinematographer, and so we went like a lot to to Moscow, Chechnya, Kazakhstan, and uh, and once after one of these shootings, I ended up kind of I wanted to discover by myself, and I took a train and went to the Arctic to discover, made friends, and so I can come back now without him, and I've like my connections now in Russia. Um, so my relationship with the collaboration, I, well, first of all, for this short film, it was, it was completely necessary 
because uh, we almost uh, didn't have anything to offer um, for producing this. So everyone that came in was in that agreement of, okay, we're gonna do this together. And so everything that started happen was just the art of collaboration by itself. But um, so, so yes, in that way it was very collective. In another way, I understand also a little bit the desire of what if we could make, what if I could make a movie all by myself? I would really like to do that, even though I know it's completely impossible because of the kind of movies that I like to make. But there is something quite, there is something quite interesting that happens in, in crews that it's like, it's not only making a film, but it's also like the, the need of communication and of understanding and of being on the same page and of meeting and talking and talking and talking and, and finding all those common grounds. And so that's all this other side of, of, this, uh, of this thing we're doing, uh, which has to also be in balance which is can, can be a challenge. But at the same time, um, I've been very lucky with the teams I've had. And I do collaborate a lot with my director of photography, Constance Sandoval. Uh, she and I have uh, been making a lot of short films and the first film we did together. And that is a collaboration. That is like the collaboration of my dreams. Uh, whenever we start uh, talking about the projects we're doing, we already know each other so well and have the same, we like exactly the same thing. So it's very fun because we can have like a whole new other level of playfulness in which it's like, oh, here we put a ghost. And by ghost, we mean that there is a light that flickers, for example. And so we, when we're talking, it's like, um, it's a very creative and, and fantastic moment of us having all these moments. And so, yeah, that's, was my highlight of collaboration. Thank you guys. Um, there is so much like inventiveness, I guess, with form sort of amongst all of your films. Can you talk a bit about sort of like upending a bit sort of traditional narratives? And maybe Sonia, you can talk a little about how difficult it is to make a short narrative. <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, you mean in Iran or in Anywhere. general? I think they're probably one of the hardest things to do successfully is to make like a fully narrative short film. I think when they really exist it's and are made well, it's sort of a miracle. It's, it's a tough yes. job. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, you're right. It's really difficult. Uh, <clears throat> not just uh, about the story and uh, picturing the story um, as uh, realistic as possible, but also definitely we have some issues for making movies in Iran. Um, uh, I mean, in terms of the stories and uh, the checking and background checking and this kind of things. Uh, but um, yeah, um, it was difficult, but um, I'm like uh, I I I love to uh, I, I love hyper realistic stories. I love working with actors and actresses um, because I'm coming from a theater background. So uh, I used to work in theater as an actress. So I know how to communicate uh, with my um, cast uh, to get what I want from them. Uh, and in this project. Uh, the the most important uh, point of the film was uh, the main actor, uh, the main actress, I mean, Sadaf. And it was really hard for me to find her. It was really uh, hard for me to find a good actress, a uh, smart one, because I needed a very young actress, uh, but at the same time, professional one. Uh, so she was a good choice because I used to um, saw um, a work from her and I knew that she's a smart uh, actress. Uh, it wasn't hard uh, working with her and she was uh, the strength of my story and my movie uh, to show the reality of that story and to uh, narrate uh, the story in that realistic way. Uh, yeah. 
Thank you. Um, You're welcome. Julian, can you talk a little bit about like maybe using the camera as a character and how that you explored your world that way? Um, yes, well, a, a, a character sometimes and sometimes not. And, and that, was the, that was the challenge to go from one to the other. And so we thought of creating something that it's uh, also technically not one or the other. So we shot something that is very steady and very machine-like. And then we recreated movement in post-production. So we like made a fake movement in the image that looks kind of if someone was holding the camera, but then, but then, but then not really. Like we have some weird stuff in it and some deformations. And so, yes, we wanted to make a little bit of an in-between in this. But then the last, I think the last words of your film, are they thank you? Is that the very yeah. end? Which feels so human and so <laughs> kind of overwhelmingly emotional and like sort of surprisingly tender. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wish uh, you would feel a little bit like, um, um, I mean, there's a play with this foreign presence that is entering the city. This, uh, this person we talked in German to. Uh, and uh, it's a bit you also, it's a bit the viewer. And, um, and so sometimes, yeah, sometimes the people talk to this, to this person and therefore to the camera. Juan, can you talk to us a bit about how you sort of adapt your films for installation spaces or gallery spaces and how maybe it changes them, if it changes them? Um, yes, I, well, for this particular like film I'm showing in this program, it is actually commissioned by a, like a museum show. So it's like a, it's like they, they have a huge space. Um, so I, I tend to, you know, like now I, 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 I finish my film and then I extract objects and story like side story for, of the character into installations or sculpture you know put it in the space um next to the video or you know the projection you know the video would be the projections um i think this is now my my practice more than you know shift from sometimes from film festival and sometimes from um, gallery museum exhibition so um I, well, to be honest, I think the difference is, is you know, the, the reaction from the audience rather than the way I work. Um, so the way I work, I think is stayed, uh, you know, pretty much similar, you know, before I, you know, sometimes I post video work online, um, you know, back like a few years ago, and then now maybe in a physical space or sometimes in a cinema. So, um, yeah, I think the difference just would be, you know, the from the audience rather than myself. Yeah. Does it change at all how you think about time or sort of like the passage of time in your works, knowing not everyone, you know, we install films in the galleries yeah. here at MoMA and just knowing that maybe someone won't always watch the whole film. I don't know. But knowing your works will also be shown in a cinema, does that sort of or that's maybe not on your mind so much? That's well, um, I, I think in the process when I work, I, when I work on the film, I don't think a lot, but I see the outcome like after work. Um, it's like, well, I understand, you know, people will come and go because I, I don't have such patience as well when I <laughs> watch shows. Uh, yeah, when or I'm you like, start in the middle, you know, it's very rare you walk into a gallery and you catch the film at the very beginning. Yeah, exactly. But um, I, I, it's funny because I found my film, the speak, the speed of my my voice, like my voiceover is like so fast now, and um, the, you know, uh, from the speed and also the the content, um, is very like very full in 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 my film now, as before. I think it is because, you know, in a physical space, like in an exhibition, people can always, or even like online um, exhibition, people can always um, watch, you know, back and forth, or they can stop or play. 
you know, like in a physical space, you can come and go, you can come back later. So I found that I don't really care, like if people didn't catch any phrases, you know, they can always rewatch it if, it's, if it is interesting. I mean, if it's not interesting for them, you know, um, they would just leave anyway. So um, now I found myself, you know, um, speaking faster and faster. I think it's, it's almost like some influence from, you know, nowadays I use, you know, phone to watch stuff like in my mobile phone. So stuff getting like more quick and, you know, come and go really fast. So I found that my work got some, you know, change from that as well. Augustina, do you want to talk to us about building a story very much through atmosphere and place and sort of reactions? Uh, yeah, uh, when when making this short film, the the main idea was to to unify to unify all these scenes throughout their the the idea of them, and uh, because generating atmospheres is something that I really, really, really enjoy and like. Um, so, so this idea was mostly to, to give this uh, godly feeling throughout the relationship of these this different elements. And I also really like when there is an association between different elements in which you understand that a bigger picture just by just by that uh, juxtaposition of things. So, so the idea was like to grab this triangle of things that may seem completely random and uh, to make them have like a, like a spiritual connection, let's say. And in that way, um, the idea was sort of like, like making the short film like really enchanting so that it could be like a little spell because it's so short and it could be like a little spell of of you like getting into the roller coaster or, or ride or golf cart, I don't know, <laughs> depends on if you like it or not. And um, just like, as, like or being a train and things passing by and, and you like just, flirting from one island to the other. And then how do you work to position like building this very sort of abstract world, but still positioning humans and actors inside of that and not letting them sort of, I guess, dominate the story in a way? Yeah. Well, to be fair, uh, on the script, there was a little bit more uh, of these actors, not much, but there was a little bit more. Um, but then in the editing, I I was thinking all the time how to how to make this relationship work, and that's actually I mean the short film is ten minutes, but I was editing more than seven months, um because uh for this triangle to work, it needed to have like a perfect or what I considered a perfect balance uh, between the elements for that to be feel more natural and, and such. And so a lot of the dialogues and actors part had to go, but because I had the feeling that when we started deciding we were doing something smaller and smaller, but but maybe stronger in a way, um, everything that was not essential was just bothering, was just unnecessary. And so, and so we did have to do a cleanup in the editing of that, like a little bit like, okay, she only needs to say, like the only two words that are said in the whole film and those are enough and, and yeah, those kinds of things. But also um, I think uh, for me as a director, it's a challenge to be realistic. <laughs> um, like it's like this, all these universes are for me way easier. Actually, if I ever tried to do like a, another kind of film I know it's going to be very very hard um, it's like I have to also learn the other side so that is also something that I'm a little bit uh, obsessed with Raji can you talk about blending I guess sort of more experimental or avant-garde film with like a maybe documentary foundation 
Yeah. Um, or until you view your work. Yeah. Um, I. Well, m maybe after the fact, I, I realized it was doing that. But um, at the time, um, I was. Uh, I, I shot the footage uh, quite some time ago, um, even before I went to film school. So uh, uh, I was really trying to create a language to uh, speak to uh, this place and uh, uh, certain ideas I had about um, uh, the civil war in Sri Lanka and also ethnography and uh, my mother's experiences, things like that. Um, I, I didn't really know how it was going to figure in, but I, I, I mean, the way I work is um, I'm creating um, a space for accidents. I want accidents to happen. And um, then if they're good, I can take credit for them. You know? And uh, but, but so I'm like, I'm, I'm really just trying to uh, collect these accidents. Um, but um, I, I didn't know if it was going to be a fiction or a documentary. I, I was shooting both, and um, I, I wasn't making a, such a distinction. But but like once you're done with the film, you have to try to figure out what it is, uh, and uh, it, it was. I, I guess it was like a hybrid hybrid documentary, um, and. Um, uh, I'm sure I'm very interested in genre, genre tropes and uh, uh, p playing with the language of cinema. So I'm sure that, I mean, that figures into it. Um, just like a light, like, uh, but- I know you're becoming um, your film. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, uh, <laughs> but- um, You mentioned that you, I think, made that footage in 2010. I think it says that at the beginning. Yeah. What was that like holding on to that or, you know, sitting on it for so long or? Um, yeah, I, I wanted to go right after the Civil War ended to shoot. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I uh, like I said, I, I didn't even know it was if it was going to be a film. Um, I had just bought my first camera and I wanted to shoot something. Right, and I, I wanted to, I had this idea, so I, I, I just very impulsively went and did it. Um, and I, I didn't know how to make a film, really. So I had to grow up and uh, eventually I was looking at the footage and I, I, I figured uh, there was something interesting there and uh, I was finding interesting associations in the edit. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I really didn't know um, what it was, but um, it was something. I guess there, I saw something there. Yeah, that's that a nice gift from your past self. It's cool. Yeah, it was like working with, a, with, with an archive, like with found footage almost, and, and nothing was precious, you know? If uh, at that point I had grown out of uh, uh, loving the footage so much, I could cut. I cut the film very quickly, actually, like in a week or something. So it was, uh, it was an easy editing process. There's a lot of ecology in your film, and actually, a lot of the films here in sort of very different ways. Um, I'm interested, Raji, in you taking this really, really lush world and rendering it in black and white. Um, yeah. Really yeah. Sorry, sorry. What I was, was just, the last... it really transforms the landscape. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I, Sri Lanka is a very touristy place. And I mean, you see a lot of pictures that are uh, like in travel magazines and stuff that, you know, really push uh, how lush and beautiful it is. And I really wanted to take that pleasure away and to focus on uh, focus on uh, t well take that pleasure away that's built into everyone 
uh, and and then uh, to focus on the ideas and the figurative aspect of what I was doing. Because um, I really love, um, a lot of my films don't have dialogue because I'm very interested in just bodies moving through space and the like, uh, the uh, rhetorical effect of uh, like uh, muscles moving and the facial gestures and stuff. Uh, that's very interesting to me. Um, so th that was kind of the, that was, that was kind of the idea behind the black and white. Um, <clears throat> also, it looked just, uh, uh, no, I mean, that, that, was, that was the idea, but uh, yeah. And Dorian, you traveled to the Arctic, which despite being covered in mass amounts of snow is climate disaster is coming for it quite rapidly and presently. Did that, the snow and like, I mean, I know you must, must have been a very cold shoot, but was that idea of climate change, was that sort of lingering in your mind at all or like affecting how you saw that place? People are very happy about it there. You know, now they have summer where they can go to the lake and swim. <laughs> <laughs> They're not <laughs> so, um, No, climate was more something that I was um, fighting against than fighting for. Uh, uh, obviously it's yeah extremely cold there uh, we also had like the idea was to shoot in the eternal night which I mean the perpetual night which is in the month of December and January is that uh, when you were there? I was to, like that was the idea because because the the, 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 the the night stays there for like the sun doesn't rise at that moment but the temperature also don't rise they go like uh, minus 30 or something like that and since it's a crew working for free, I thought maybe it's not a good idea to stay uh, for that temperature. So we postponed the shooting to uh, end of February, uh, where it's supposed to be a bit warmer. But then we had to play everything at night to pretend that it was at this time. Um, uh, bad luck, it was like the coldest week ever. We had like minus 30 all the time when we were out and we had to shoot at night. So we will just have what's the most terrible day <laughs> all the time. Yeah. the sound too of your film really makes it sound so cold and so wet those kind of like surreal wet footsteps that are following you is yeah. that something you were like feeling as it was happening i just can't imagine being there with the camera <laughs> we um so none of the sound that you hear in the film is taken in in russia uh everything is recreated and especially for that reason, for like like the the possibility of transforming the footstep in snow into footstep of um, water, and and change all these parameter and like trick your mind in giving you a lot of information that's unreal, but then just switching one little parameter that makes you like completely uh, believe that you are in another um, universe somehow. Yeah, very delirious feeling. <laughs> Wong, I'm curious what, you know, I guess the ecology of your world is quite different than some of these very natural landscapes, but I'm curious what drew you to animals in the form of the fable to sort of like tell these very political or contemporary anxious stories. What makes animals well suited for that? Um, yeah, it, I think it all started I, you know, because uh, uh, my media is in animations and uh, for for a long time, my, my work's been like banned in some countries due to the contents like sexual content or the violence, stuff like that. So I've been always wanted to make my animation for kids, like a cartoon. Um, so because my work is like heavily um, narrative, like a lot of dialogue. So writing is, I spend more time like write than doing the actual animation. So um, writing is very important in my work. So I am thinking like doing a book, like to make, to write a book um, for kids. And then I went to the library and look at those like famous old time fables like Aesop's fables on the fairy tales uh, from Andersons. And I found that it's not really like 
related to me, like or related to the modern time, I guess. Um, there's a lot of one thing I found that is re really interesting is like it's like in the Aesop's Fables, I found that it spends like a page, a whole page for a story between like two animals, and then the other page is like explaining that page to the kids like how they should behave because the, what is this story about so i think it's it's like a like a spoiler like a spoiler alert stuff like that like why would it happen in the same book uh twice so um so i thought i i would like to give it you know give it a go to make my own fables you know and wish one day um my my collection would be in the library for kids <laughs> but so so far i've been like finished like two fables but and then i don't know i i mean um i turn it into animation at the end so not writing but like video yeah that's my my starting like starting point yeah Augustina, I was really struck rewatching your film last week at just how sort of magical nighttime feels and or sort of anxious or full of possibilities. And I don't know, just during quarantine, I guess I haven't been outside at night very much. And the few times I do, it's like, oh, wow, like anything could happen. And I was so struck with that feeling of how you just render darkness. Um, mm -hmm. Is night something you sort of like is that an inspiration point for you? Is this kind of like all watching eye while people are sleeping or maybe should be sleeping? Yeah, definitely. Um, for, for some reason, for all of my life, since I was like eight, no, I was nine and I saw the ring. <laughs> and from that on, I had insomnia the rest of my life until 22, 23. But so, so like, 10 years old, 11, 12, 14, I would be like until 4 a.m. like looking at, at the ceiling of my house and being like, no, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I can't. And so I, I started to be a very late sleeper in that sense. But so I have a lot, a lot, a lot of memories of being a child that is contemplating the void of existence <laughs> and and just like being like nothing has meaning, everything is terrifying, and like having all these very, very deep thoughts for a child. And I think I think that is the fuel of almost like 80% of the things I do. Just that feeling. Uh, which now I'm very appreciative it happened because I it's like a whole new thing that I really like to work with. And so I think that it has a little bit to do with that. Also that, uh, also regarding that, the short film that is, like my idea was to use as reference also like some horror films I saw on the Square TV when I was in in my room in the in the 90s, 2000. And so all of these sorts of elude towards that, that moment. Also uh, the girl that is wearing the spikes and she's dressed like very goth, I dressed like that when I was like 12. So it's all like a little bit of like a transport, a transportation of magical nights, I guess, in that sense. And yeah, and we actually filmed it all in afternoons and then most of it is post-production. Wow. In the night. Wait, and, and also another thing is that uh, I, the goal when, when making these sequences go together and when filming them uh, was to find a movement in stillness. And so how like, like we had like a monotone sound like Ooh, with a power plant, for example, like Ooh, and we would see like quietness and stillness and nothing would move, but we would get anxious anyway. Like we would get like excited anyway. And so all of that was, was, yeah. Sonia, I know there's not also not a traditional ecology in the world of your film, but I've been thinking a lot lately about urban city spaces and man-made spaces as nature, as an extension of humans or human destruction as nature itself. 
and the classroom as a space becomes really so nerve-wracking and oppressive. Can you maybe just talk about building that like indoor tension? Yes, sure. Uh, actually, um, um, the scene of the class, especially the scene of the class was coming from my own experience at uh, our high school. Um, and um, we, we experienced uh, a situation. I mean, me and my friends, uh, a day this happened to us and all the uh, details and acts you see in that scene, they're coming from that day. Even uh, uh, when uh, the big uh, principal, when she takes out the waiver from the bag of one of the students, uh, it happened, uh, it was real. And uh, uh, the laugh um, um, we hear from the students, all these things. So I think one of the um, reasons that everyone says that why the scene is so, uh, moving and we have a lot of stress and we are sitting on the edge of our seats when we are, we are watching that scene. It's because uh, uh, I knew that situation and I, I, was, um, uh, I was just recreating that moment again. Um, and uh, even I was looking uh, for a um, actress for an actress for uh, the principal uh, to be as um, similar as possible to the ones we had and um, so that maybe that's why um, you, you feel that you know you feel that atmosphere actually um, so I, I was um, trying hard to uh, find um, a school with that architecture because I wanted to be with the school uh, with the high um, to be um, same as the high school um, I was studying in and it was really hard uh, to find and at the end I, I found a high school which was for boys because you know before university in Iran uh, the schools are separated for girls and boys. So uh, it was, again, uh, it was uh, super hard for us to uh, like uh, get the school um, two days uh, empty uh, for the shoot. Um, and also like uh, streets and all, the, all these things, uh, I had thought about them. Uh, about the atmosphere and uh, I tried my best to have my shoot uh, in a, a cloudy weather. So we were waiting for like two, three weeks uh, and we, uh, we were keep postponing at shoot um, to have a cloudy weather uh, because Tehran was uh, super sunny, um, too sunny uh, during those uh, days and time of the year. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much. I think we're out of time. Thank you all for joining across Thank you. time zones and places. I'm sorry, we can't all share a beer and meet in real life, but it was great to meet you here. Thank you everyone for watching. Yeah, <laughs> you're Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you.